Today, I have a very special guest. It's Stephanie Kurtzuba, and she plays me in The Machine, the movie that's coming out uh, May 25th. Go to themachine.movie if you want to buy tickets ahead of time. If you want a link to get merch for the movie, you can go there. You can also go to burtburtburt.com to buy merch from the movie. Um, I'm so excited about the movie itself. It's really great. And Stephanie was amazing. I got to choose. Uh, well, I didn't get to choose, but I got to have a little bit of a say in who played me. And she was just perfect. And I I ended up getting a really good friend out of it. She and I have remained friends. We spent a week together in Serbia and we've kept up with each other the whole two years since that movie wrapped. And I'm just privileged and lucky to call her a real friend. And she's also a very big actress who's been in like Martin Scorsese movies and like a, a Wolf of Wall Street and she's on Blue Bloods and she's just a great actress. So we talk about um, being an actress, being a parent, um, growing up in Omaha, having a mom that had an eating disorder. We just talk about a lot of stuff. And she's a lovely, wonderful human being. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Stephanie Kurtzuba as much as I did. Please tell your friends, buy movie pick tickets, go to the movies with your friends. It's always more fun, especially with an action movie, to watch it on the big screen. So yeah, buy your tickets, themachine.movie, and uh, we'll see you at the movies. <laughs> Your friends who who do the Skip Town All Stars. Oh, aren't they sweet? There, she is the sweetest little thing. She has she sent is. me like messages here and there on just, and we've started just back and forth. No She's way! So nice. Well, because uh, you didn't know this, mm. we took off for a year. We did almost the same thing they did. I did know during that during the pandemic. Oh, did I tell yes. you that? I think I actually told her that when she and James were first telling me about that idea, like when there was a colonel. They're so cool. Aren't they what cool? What a cool couple. Yeah. They're a cool couple. It's a great concept for a podcast. Are you a Scorpio? No, I'm a Pisces. No way. Yeah. What are you? A Leo. Yeah, of course you are. We were just out. We were, Bert and I had a date last night. We went to see Dwight Yoakam. Oh, and, nice. Uh, I'm a huge fan of his, like for my whole life. Mm. And uh, I started listening to him in 1990. I know exactly the first time I heard him on the radio and it was like, the heavens opened. I don't know what it is about this particular artist, huh. but he connected to me immediately. Uh, I grew I grew up listening to classic country music, but I also grew up going to like bluegrass festivals once a year and oh, his rockabilly thing. But last night we're there singing and every single, every single song of his is about a woman who done him wrong. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Every song is like... Every song, I'm singing the lyrics, and at one point, I turned to Bert and I go, wow, I must have been really hurt, because <laughs> as soon as I found his music, I was like, this is what I'm talking about. And I listen to it now, and I go, yeah, I don't need any of this. Yeah, right. You and, don't, yeah, you don't connect to it the same way you did no, then. No, I don't need any of this. There's, I don't like, funny? wake up with this massive loss and longing and <laughs> woman wiped her feet on me and i was like i think this is actually all about my mother and I, I thought it was about let's unpack that shit Ooh. right i think it is actually about my mother because a lot uh. of it is like him feeling so, like such sh this woman making him feel like shit about oh himself and just leaving him and i was like that's I, fucking deep girl 30 years later i go hmm I know, right? I don't think that was about a boy for me. Uh -huh. I think that was still about a woman. Mm. Just my mother. Isn't it just turns out it was mom. Boy, there's that's such a beautiful and wonderful and fraught fucking relationship. Well, you're the mother of daughters, so yeah. you know better than I. But like, I am I have to tell you, when I had when I got pregnant the second time and found out it was a boy, I cried not because everyone was like, oh, you wanted a girl. I was like, no, I was so fucking relieved. Right? <laughs> to have another boy. Just because there was... My mother was amazing. I lost her early, Aww. but it was fraught. You know what I mean? It was, mm -hmm. it's just a complicated relationship. It's just different. And right? I didn't want to, and I didn't, somehow I thought that I wasn't going to pass on some of the same shit to a boy mm -hmm. than if I had had a, a daughter. Mm -hmm. So, which may or might, may not be true. I don't know. Do you not know if it's true or not? I feel like, I feel like 80% of the stuff I was fearing that I would pass on. I haven't because they are male children, which I know sounds bizarre, but there was just so much with my mom. My mom had an eating disorder. Oh. And I lost her to an eating disorder. To an eating disorder. Yeah. That's really difficult. So, and it was, and then being in this industry, yeah. like, it's like, ugh, 
is just b- messages after messages. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I was like, I really don't want to pass this crap on. And I thought in America, at least like male children don't get this. They don't they still get an onslaught of messages, but they're not necessarily as body image related. Mm hmm. I don't know. Maybe that's a generalization that's not true anymore. But. No, I think it is somewhat true, but you know, eating disorders are so complicated. They can be from so many different places. Yeah. You know, a lot of, not a lot of them, but some of them are, are a personality disorder. Mm-hmm. You know, some of them are trauma related. Some of them are anxiety related. It, you yeah. Know. My mom had a, a chem, she was diagnosed with a chemical imbalance when she finally mm-hmm. started trying to get, you know, help to deal with it. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, and it's all, you know, it's power and it's mm. esteem and it's like, it's just, it's personality. It's like all of that yeah. swirling. That's, so it would, I would imagine it would be the hardest thing to treat because you have to eat. You have to, yeah. right? Yeah. You don't have to drink alcohol to live. Yeah. You know, there's no getting around it. No. Yeah. You, you have to deal with it. You have to deal with the you thing. You have to eat. That yeah. must've been really hard. How old were you when she died? I was, well, I was 16. When she, so she, so she basically hadn't eaten enough and collapsed because she didn't have enough electrolytes. Mm. So her heart stopped. Mm. And then by the time they got her heart started, she was, she'd had brain damage. So she was in a coma for three years. So she was years like at my house, like we took care of her and yeah, it was a lot. That is a lot. Sometimes I tell this story and it's like almost disassociative for Uh me because I'm like, you, you tell the story so many times you're just like. Oh, right. That was my story. That happened to me. Mm. Um, but she but she passed away when I was 19. Mm. So but and it was and it was one of those situations where it was like her only life support was a feeding tube. Mm. So the irony is mm. when you remove a feeding tube, the person dies of starvation, which is just I mean, that's a mind fuck right that there. That is a big mind. Fuck. You know, so. Wow. I'm sorry. Oh, that's no. I mean, hard. thank you. Yeah. I miss her. And. I wish she was here. I wish she was here for shit like this. Of course. She would have been, and her and her grandkids, like she would have lost her mind. Yeah. She would have loved it. And she was so much fun. Yeah. I feel bad for the boys that they missed out on that. Right. You know? I do. I understand. My mom's really fun. But I believe, my mom's never been diagnosed, but I believe she has a really um, serious personality disorder. Mm. And she's not safe. Um, so I, I could, you know, she chose not to be in my fam- my family's life. She right. was very adamant with her choice that we were dead to her, that she didn't want to know anything about her kids or her kid or her grandkids or Bert or nothing. Wow. Um, and it, so it was so adamant and strong and it had happened so many times in my life. It happened when I was 13 and then 23 and then the rejection pregnant with Georgia, not just rejection, the shut out. You're dead. So Don't pain. talk to you for years. Like gone for years. I'm sorry, Leanne. That's so painful. Kind of, it's really crazy. Um, but the flip side of it is my mom was really fun. <laughs> I mean, I actually think I have her personality. Uh, uh-huh. She's just a bit broken uh, yeah. and can't really um, cope with regular parts of life. Like, I don't know, fighting with a husband because she's got six divorces oh so like she can't really she can't get through the like conflict resolution if it's a conflict it's done if there's a conflict if you are against her she deems it like a threat to her life to her Mm -hmm. very being and just can't do it Mm -hmm. and and gets hurt so deeply over things that would be hurtful to a regular person but you'd want to find a path out of that hurt Mm -hmm. and you'd want to self-reflect and go well what's my part of that it may be 10% me, but I'm somewhere in the mix here. You know, there's none of that. It's it's so interesting because from the moment that I met you, yeah, I was so struck. Well, the literally the first night we met, we ha- we were hanging out with a big group and like you came to me towards the end of the night and we were kind of connecting and you said something. I've heard you say this twice tonight. You said to me. Yeah. We just met. And you like <gasps> Like put your finger on something like that. I was like, uh, uh, <laughs> sorry. No, no. But I, in the most wonderful way, because right. it's like, like you saw me, I you know. were like, I see you. And I was so like, <gasps> and I was like, this woman <laughs> has it. No, but like you have it. She's clearly worked through her, her own brokenness. I have tried really hard. Do you know what I mean? Mm. To, to be able to have the generosity of spirit to share with me, not knowing me from Adam. Like, I see something in you that you might want to pay attention to. Right. I was so 
taken by that. I was so mm -hmm. taken by you in that moment. Aww. And it doesn't surprise me to hear you tell this story now because as the daughter of somebody who consistently um, hurt you like that, mm -hmm. you know, it takes a lot of self-reflection and a lot of work on oneself to move out of that cycle mm -hmm. and to have the family that you have now and the functioning relationships with your own daughters. Yeah. Thank Just, you for saying that. Yeah. It has been a lot of work. And one, the the positive about being raised with someone who has mental challenges is that you read, you learn to read people really quickly. And I know for me, um, the good and the bad of that is that um, I have often been uh, accused of being a little intense <laughs> and a little too direct. You're really intense. I am so intense. <laughs> it gets me in trouble sometimes. <laughs> The email I sent this morning might have been a little bit. <laughs> I love but, your um, Yeah, I, and so, I think it's a wonderful trait. But I watch people who aren't like you, who are open and and accepting, really get flipped out. So I, I don't do that to everybody. Well, because I can't do that to everybody. You know, I can relate <laughs> in a in a sense. I've always often said that be, growing up with a mom who had these shifts in mood very quickly. I'm sure they were related to appetite. She was probably fucking hungry. Do you yeah. know what I mean? But Blood sugar, I, anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I used to like say it was sometimes being around mom was uh, kind of walking on eggshells a little bit, but it forced me to read people really well and read moods and read the subtext and read the energy. And I've often said as an actor, mm -hmm. my superpower is that tuning into that, that sensitivity. Yeah. And so to hear you say that, I'm like, mm -hmm. that's what it is. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. It makes superhumans if you're willing to, to learn from it. Yes. You and know? it's, and I, and I agree with you about the ability to be really direct and cut through the noise mm -hmm. being something that you have to use judiciously. Mm -hmm. um, it took me a long time to really to really pare away a lot of the good girl stuff. Mm -hmm. I think living in New York helped a lot. Mm -hmm. The sort of, you know, I always disliked the brusqueness of New Yorkers, but I always have appreciated the directness mm -hmm. of New Yorkers, right? Yes. So it's taken me a long time to reach that too, where I can go, I can cut through the noise and I can appreciate the straight arrow, but also know who can accept the arrow. Mm -hmm. Not everybody can. Not everybody can. And that's, and that's okay. That's it's valid. Fine. Yeah, it's you don't want to. Great. It's not obliterating someone. No, you know what I mean. It's about helping. Yes, I used to. I used to obliterate people, but as I've aged, I think I figured out our job as we age is not to be a boss, is to be a mentor, mm. right? It's not to be a parent. Mm -hmm. uh, in you are a parent, but you know they break down. You can break down every relationship into three parts. You're either the parent, the child, or the adult. And the only way you okay. can really parent is to adult, right? Mm -hmm. If you're the parent, then you're lording over and you're la, 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 la. Right, la. right, right. Maybe you're a parent when your child is sick and they need care. You right. shift into that. Uh -huh. But you have to stay the adult. Well, you have to stay that <sighs> everywhere, you know? Oh, I do, yes. So if you're a boss and you're bossing somebody, you're being a parent. You know? Oh, okay. And, and if you're an employee and you're like, well, my boss, just my boss, well, then you're being a child. So if you, as a boss, you can remain an adult. Oh, I love this. And in being an adult, what you do is you look at problems and you go, how can I mentor this into effective, positive change? Uh -huh. Which is what you do as a parent, when not being a parent, but as an effective as an parent effective. to a child yes. in real life. Not the dynamic I'm talking about. That's what you have to do is you look at your child and you go, okay, how can I effectively, like, let's have a conversation about the behavior, right. not from a place of yelling or angry or punitive. Right, right, but right. How right. do we fix this problem? I so, love that because you know what that does? Mm. It gives everybody autonomy, mm -hmm. right? It, it, it shifts the power dynamic. It does. If I am an adult and I can show up to whatever conversation as an employee or an employer or whatever... I don't have to be submissive or be dominant. I can own my own experience mm -hmm. and meet you at the same level. That's right. Right? And then ultimately, that's where all the power is. So yes. you think the power's in the parent. No. But it's not. Mm -hmm. The parent is powerless 
And the child is powerless. The only power lies in being an adult. That's it. I if if everybody could digest that, I feel like the <laughs> so many problems would be fixed. I agree with you. Like almost instantaneously because it just takes away that dynamic of us and them mm-hmm. or higher or lower or all that status stuff, mm-hmm. you know? You know why I had to do that? Huh? Because of who I'm married to. <laughs> I'm Tell married me to more. somebody that's Let's not talk been about a that. child. And at a certain point, I was like, I'm not going to be your old mommy. I'm you know, you know what's you know what's a real killer in the bedroom? Well, yeah, feeling right? like someone's <laughs> fucking mom. Now that it didn't show up there, but if we were in an argument, yes. he was immediately either my parent or my child. Mm. And I was like, I'm not doing this. So I just wouldn't engage as a parent or child. I would stay an adult. Oh, and if so I good. stay an adult, it would force him to become an adult. Oh, that's so good. So and he rose to the occasion. Most of the time. <laughs> We do have a th- couple theme songs for him when he doesn't. He is either martyr man, martyr man, who's going to be the smarter man? That's one. Or we go Vic, Vic, victim, Victoria, Victoria. You choose. Depends on the situation. Oh, I love that. I love that they're both like ridiculous. The victim or the martyr. Like yes. that is some old school like. Right. Italian grandma shit right there. His freaking Burt Kreischer all damn day. When he gets in trouble for something, when he thinks he's uh, in trouble, he goes straight to martyr. Mm, and I'm the victim here. And I'm like, mm, everybody fucks up from time to time. Everybody. So just be a grown up and say, yep. I'm so sorry. Take responsibility. 100%. Let's talk it through. Let's move on. 100%. He's yeah. deflect, 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 deflect. Or, well, if you had been oh, blah, 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 parent, girl. parent, parent. So early in our marriage, I figured that out. I don't really know how I figured that out. I good must have read you. it somewhere or something. I mean, but good for you because I'm sure that saved you guys years of arguments and and troubled dynamics. And then you add kids to the mix and it gets even more complicated. Yes. You know? Yes. He's very much a parent as a parent. Mm-hmm. And I've always tried to be an adult as a parent. And uh, sometimes the parent as a parent is a good thing. And. Sometimes. It can be good. It yeah. can be good just because sometimes it, there needs to be sort of the voice of authority, I yeah. guess. And the shame piece. And the shame you know, piece, right. How yeah. dare you treat your mother that way? <laughs> and I'm behind the scenes going, fuck yeah. Tell her, tell her. That's, um, Josh and I have definitely found our, we both, I think, found our way collectively. We definitely had that same dynamic of like, I would turn into his mom uh-huh. if he felt like he did something wrong or I was, you know. And the problem is, is that my husband is so fucking smart yeah. that he would be his deflections like we'd be into like seven of them before I went, oh, wait, you're doing that thing. <laughs> God damn it. The you original I mean? thought was. Yeah. yeah back uh-huh. to the point. Uh-huh. Um, but he I have to give him such credit. He at, at one point I said to him, I was like. Your relationship with our oldest was starting to get like he was hypercritical and and sort of doing this thing. And I was like, but he wasn't doing it to our younger son. And I was like, it's because our oldest is so much like him. Mm -hmm. Something's up there. I was like, you need to get into therapy and and sort that. And I give him so much credit. He was like, you're right. I do. I'm going to do it. Amazing. And he fucking got in and he did the work. And it that dynamic shifted like like miraculously. It's amazing. It's amazing. And I was like, and it in turn also sorted some stuff for him and a lot of little things, little hiccups between us kind of smoothed out and amazing. This sounds like I'm saying that everything was always his fault, which is not what I mean. No, no, no. But no. you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I do. And, and there was a cycle that they weren't breaking somehow. Yeah, and that's exactly what it cycle, was. Yeah. And it was related to his father. Totally. Who he grew up the son of an alcoholic. And, you mm. know, and he was dealing with stuff that he didn't even realize right. he was dealing with. And when he started to unpack that, it was like, oh, all of a sudden we could be adults right. together. Yeah. You know what I mean? I and do. that has and that has continued throughout our own relationship. And he's continued to do work on himself and I've worked on myself and it's amazing. Yeah. It cleared the clutter. Cleared the shit. And you know what? Like I, I We've been through enough generations, both of us on both sides of our family uh, of stuff. Like we don't, we don't need to carry that forward in, no. into the next generation. No, you don't. You know what I mean? You don't have to. You don't have to. It's a choice. At a certain point, you have to you have to lay all that down and go. I don't choose that. 
you know? Yeah. I choose this other path. And I may not even know how to do that other path, but I'm not doing right. the one that I was walking. Because this isn't necessarily serving me. No, exactly. Anymore. And it takes time and energy to like rethink stuff that you just espouse uh-huh. by rote uh-huh. that you don't even realize is by rote. We're, we are atheists in my family. Yeah. Both Josh and I grew up in Catholic families. And, you know, particularly with him, they really wanted him to, they thought he was going to go into like, some sort of priesthood or something. No way. You know what I mean? It was weird. It's weird. Were, I'm like, have you were, met him? They were intense. But yeah, they're intense. But he um he and I both wait, was I, where was I going with this? Because now I'm thinking about you were his both family. atheists. Both atheists, but relating to to the prior thing is that one one time our 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 older son came home and he had said, like, ah, oh, Jesus Christ. Like, <laughs> and Josh was like, you can't say that. And I was like, needle off the record. And I was like, well, that's not a nice thing to say in polite company because a lot of people are believers and you have to respect that. Yeah. Just because we don't doesn't mean it's any better or any less than, you know, blah, blah, blah. And Josh was like, no, he can't. He can't say that. And I was like, motherfucker, you don't believe in any God. What do you? <laughs> right. That's like saying fudge sickles. Right. It's the same. Or has Mussolini. The same <laughs> yeah, Mussolini. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I had to like, and he pushed back and he deflected and we finally got to the point where he just had to laugh at himself. I was like, there is stuff that we are both carrying totally. that we do not believe in mm-hmm. that we are espousing by rote and like our children don't need to take that on. Yeah, totally. We don't even believe that. Right. Isn't that so, interesting? I know. The human psyche fascinates me to no end. I know, me too. It really is fascinating. Yeah, I think, you know, I went to acting school. Yes, I know. Um, we and I think that. that's why I went to acting school, because I was fascinated with human nature. And what ended uh, was, you know, I became a writer because right. I was fascinated with human nature. How fun is it to be an actress? I, lo- I love what I do. You do. I, I, can I tell. love what I do. I, and I feel so grateful to be doing it at all, because it's just, as you know, it's just, it's a hard career Mm -hmm. it's you know it is hard but you're always working yeah always working I see you in something all the time I feel like you know I I always feel like I could be doing more I could be you know what I mean (laughs) I always I'm like I could be doing more I have more to offer and that's actually one thing that in the last like few years I've realized I have a creative side that is served by other things that I always just focused on acting thinking oh well that's where I get my that's where I get my creative juices flowing but I've started dabbling in writing That's awesome. and I've started like making things of my own, you know, manageable stuff, uh-huh. you know, um, but it's it scratches a different side of that same itch. Mm-hmm. And I understand now what an easy transition it would be from you being an actor mm-hmm. into being a writer. Yes. Yeah, so because it, it's sort of the same mm-hmm. sort of is different, but it's sort of the same. What do you find with your writing? Like, does it does it call on all those acting school lessons? I don't know. I think I never really was an actor. I really? think I was always a writer, uh, but didn't know how to do that. Got it. Right? So you see actors on TV. I'm from a really small town. No, I never thought, well, someone wrote what they're saying, oh. you know, and that sounds really dumb in the world that we live in. But I grew up in a town of like 1,600 people. Oh my and God, that's he, tiny. Uh, uh, 1,600 people. And and no one thought about how Hollywood works. You know, you you hear about the big, the movie stars or right. John Ford or John Houston, you know, all these big directors that you understood they ran the whole movie. But I think in a general sense, nobody thinks, yeah, someone's writing that, you know? Yeah, no, I think I probably had the same, the same experience. I mean, I just remember being obsessed with I wanted to be in the world. Mm-hmm. I didn't stop to think, oh, somebody created that world or that's a set or whatever. I just like I would watch fame everywhere and just cry oh. and be like, I want to be there. That's where I want to be. I want to be there. I want to dance <laughs> in the lunchroom. That's so <laughs> like, cute. You know I know. So I had similar. I re- my dad and I were talking about where Bert and I are at the moment. And I said, you know, when I was in Georgia in college watching the Academy Awards, <laughs> thinking, I want to be there. That's where I want to be. I want to be with that group of people. Mm. It wasn't, I don't think it was even about winning an award and standing up there and going, thank you so much. Right. It was about being surrounded with that level of creativity and passion 
and you felt somehow those were your tribe. I did. You, and if I could just get with them. That's right? exactly right. Yeah. And it wasn't really about the accolades. It was about the 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 create the massive creativity. So I just went toward creativity. So I think that the most obvious choice for creativity was acting. Uh -huh. And I really enjoyed acting, but I was a nervous wreck, like shaking really? the whole time I would act. You weren't like that on the set of, of the movie. But I'm a, yeah, I'm also 50. At, <laughs> well, at, at yeah, 20, some, yeah, I get you. I was Life a wreck. Experience. And, uh, and, and at a certain point, I was like, I actually don't enjoy like almost vomiting every day. <laughs> To go to class. I don't know that this is going to oh. work for me. So I'm just going to write what I'm going to say on stage and see how that works. Way better. Uh -huh. So I was writing stuff for myself. And I was like, oh. oh, this is way better. And then I started working for a director who gave me parts that were Southern and just me. Just close to you. So I just so you showed up and went, yeah. hey, y'all, what you doing? on get in the other room. It's time to pack, you know. And I was, <laughs> and I was like, that I can do. But this like upheaval of now I am like Maggie on a cat on a to forget it. Uh, no Although that you have been great as Maggie. I got cast in a, pl a play, a small production as Maggie, and I was a nervous really? disaster. It was almost torture. I oh, could, I, I did it, thing. but I was like, I don't actually think this is for me. I think I much <sighs> prefer writing and having watching someone else do that. I'd much rather see somebody else do that. See, it's interesting that you say that because I never had any issue with the the attention or the like mm -hmm. that that place. <laughs> I'm fine with it. But you know what makes me want to vomit just thinking about what Bert does? Oh, I could never do what Bert does. I no. mean, no. that would be, I don't know, that would make me want to throw up. I wouldn't yeah, be able I to make it. it. Just being just, I don't know. Standing on stage and and I mean, I know he's got things that are written that, you know, he he but he's also just so off the cuff. Yeah, he is. To trust that I would be enough to yeah. stand on a stage and do that for an hour makes me want to shit myself. Yeah, not for me. He also often does shit himself before. So he, he he does have a lot of that problem still. He gets still he still gets really nervous sometimes. Does he really? Yeah, he does. Um God. especially when he's working on new material, you know, yeah, he gets right. nervous. He gets stomach issues uh, for sure. Oh, but God. yeah, it just wasn't for me. At a certain point, I was like, you know, life's too short to be this stressed out and upset for a job. Like I and yeah. I was always the one that were I would always be like, oh, she would be great for this role. So she should do it. Oh, that's interesting. So you could always spot other. Yeah. Spot other talent that. Yeah. Would plug in. I'm not right for this role, but she is. Oh. So she should do it. And, and then I'll just step out. And I'm like, I'll never make a dime. <laughs> yeah, like that. no, no way. <laughs> Unless you went into casting. <laughs> exactly, right? But anyway, how'd you get into acting? Um, pr Probably just through dancing. You know, typical sort of grew up in the Midwest dance class. And I remember I was 10 and they were having an audition for a, like a local production of Oliver. Mm-hmm. And I, um, I don't think I'd ever sang in public or anything like that, but I auditioned and got in and that was, I mean, you know, Bit by the I book. can dance and sing and, you know, this idea of acting was like, I wasn't even thinking about acting. It was just, I guess it came from the movement. It was just emotionally connecting to movement mm -hmm. is where it came out for me. In fact, I remember my senior year of high school, I, um, we did Pippin. Mm -hmm. um, and I was the leading player because I'm clearly very much like Ben Vereen. So that was <laughs> easy very casting. Nice. No, but I remember there was a woman who came in to like choreograph the local production or whatever. And um, she was working with me one day in rehearsal. And she said, have you ever considered going to Juilliard or, or applying to Juilliard? I'm like, no, Juilliard, please. And I was like, do you really think that I'm a strong enough dancer for that program? And she just looked at me and she went, Oh, no, sweetheart, for acting. Oh, wow. And it was the first time I thought, wait, wait a minute. Oh, maybe I'm an actor. Mm -hmm. I always thought of myself as a dancer who could sing and and enjoyed acting. And but that she planted the she planted the professional seed. I mean, I was doing like local community theater and mm -hmm. high school plays and stuff like that. And I um, I actually ended up going to the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. My mom was still sick, so I wanted to be close to home. Mm -hmm. I got there at Leanne. I lasted like two months. You did? Why? I was, Because I was 18. 
my mom was sick. Her life was pretty much over. I was having this like, I called it my epiphany moment where I literally woke up. I was like, I'm 18. And I'm like, do you remember the three sisters, the Chekhov play? Mm -hmm. There's the one sister who dresses all in black. And like, they're like, Masha, what's wrong? Why are you always so sad? And why are you dressed in black? You're like 20. And she's like, I'm in mourning for my life. <laughs> right? Which yes. is like, and I literally woke up and I was like, fuck, I'm like in mourning for my life at 18. Yeah. Because I was sort of settled. But mm -hmm. in that moment, I literally was like, I think I want to be an actor. And I'm, and I literally, like, I think I went to the library because this was before you could, like, really Google anything. Yeah. And I was like, huh, it says that the top three acting programs are Juilliard. I don't know. Was it maybe Yale mm -hmm. and NYU? Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I'm not going to get any Yale. Um, and Juilliard is like, I didn't even think I could touch it. So I was like, well, I'll audition for NYU. And literally within three months of that decision, I went to New York City for the first time. I auditioned and I was accepted and I had started school. Wow. But, you know, I mean, it sounds like, oh, my God, what presence of mind you had at 18. But it wasn't. It was just I had lived through something which is like nobody's promising you shit. Mm -hmm. I could I could drop dead tomorrow because mm -hmm. I just watched this happen to my mom and like my whole everything was pulled out from under me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, if I don't just pony up now where are you gonna be yeah what am i gonna do and i was like well if i don't get in then i'll just uh I'll, i don't i'll do something else figure it out yeah it was meant to be i feel like that was the most beautiful gift that she my mom was an amazing mother mm -hmm. but i feel like that was the most amazing gift she gave me mm. in her you know in her absence mm -hmm. she gave i i she had done all the you know She'd done all the parenting that gave me, I guess, the confidence or the just sort of balls to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that was her that was her her sort of golden lesson to me. Like nothing's promised, kid. Get out there. Right. Get off your ass. Don't be afraid of it. Just do it. And life is short. And life is short. And life is short. So that's that's how I ended up, it, you know, doing this. Yeah. That's a great story. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I, I am yeah. not an atheist. Yes. But I am not religious. Oh, interesting. But I'm spiritual. Believe, I'm very spiritual. And I believe when things happen effortlessly like that, mm -hmm. it is from spirit. Yeah. That it just. I feel her. Gives I it, feel her yeah, in those moments. A hundred percent. So call it whatever you want. I think it comes from some other place than here. It comes from your presence of mind and your own inner wisdom. Absolutely. But for it to just all line up and work in that effortless way, <sighs> something was working with you. I believe it. So not to convert there's you, but a, that's what I really there's believe. A few, there's a few of those moments Yeah, in my life. And I don't, even though I, I do say I'm an atheist, I, I do feel her presence. Yeah. My, so my, my thing is, and I said this, like I wrote my grandmother's eulogy. Mm. And I said, it is my belief that people live on. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in eternal life and and heaven. I grew up with all that, so I know I know how that's all espoused to work. Mm -hmm. But is my belief the lessons that we teach, the lessons that we carry and receive, the people who impact us, all of that becomes part of our DNA, mm -hmm. and we carry that through life with us, and we share it with the people, everyone we come into contact with. So. What you're getting as Stephanie is really Nellie mm -hmm. Purcello and Connie Kurt Zuba mm -hmm. and all of these people who are in me mm -hmm. and have come before me and informed who I am. And in those moments where I feel grandma, I feel grandpa, I feel my mom, I, I know, I know that they are there. Right. Whether I think of them in a spiritual plane or just in a more DNA based, you know. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. Really beautiful. Today's episode of Wife of the Party is brought to you by Warby Parker. I wear glasses. I wear progressives. I can't wear contacts. Uh, and I have been losing my glasses lately. I think it's because I am A, middle-aged, or B, really old, or C, middle-aged. And I just can't really keep up with them anymore. So you know what I did? went to Warby Parker and I got my free try on 
program at home. I ordered five pairs of glasses to try at home for free. And then I got to place an order and uh, get the glasses. And they were, it was so pain-free. It was awesome. Um, They offer everything you need for happier eyes. Eyeglasses, sunglasses, contact lenses, and eye exams. You can shop with them online or in stores. You can download the Warby Parker app and you can use their virtual try-on, allowing you to try on eyeglasses, seeing the realistic color, texture, and size of each style using just your iPhone. Glasses start at $95, and that includes prescription lenses. They start at $95, including prescription lenses. Can't beat that. Um, You can try five pairs at home for free at warbyparker.com slash wife. This podcast is brought to you by Factor. Do you know what Factor is? Because I do. I love their smoothies. I buy their smoothies and then I put a little protein power in them. And now I have a protein shake that's yummy and delicious. I like the mango and I like the strawberry. They're so yummy. And you know what's really great? It's super easy. You just kind of go online, order it, and it shows up at your door. It's pretty, pretty awesome. If you need an extra boost of energy to support your wellness goals this spring, try the Protein Plus meals with 30 grams of protein or more per serving. They offer delicious flavor-packed options on the menu each week to fit a variety of lifestyles from keto to calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and Protein Plus, prepared by chefs and approved by dietitians. Each meal has all the ingredients you need to feel satisfied all day long while meeting your goals. And if you're looking to mix it up, you can add a protein to a select vegan or veggie meal each week. Head to factormeals.com slash wife50 and use code wife50 to get 50% off your first box. That's code wife50 at factormeals.com slash wife50 to get 50% off your first box. See, this is you. Why do you get so deep with me? Stop it. (laughs) I'm just a deep, abrupt, direct, (laughs) intimidating person, I've been told. No, I love (laughs) that stuff because that, you know, life is so easy and so hard. Right. You know, at the same time, (sighs) all the time. And it's dealing with the easy is easy. Mm -hmm. Dealing with the hard is what makes you who you are. Right. Mm -hmm. That's who makes you who you are. So if you can deal with the hard uh, with something as beautiful as what you described. Right. It makes the heart a lot lighter. Yeah. And I believe my grandmother, my dad's parents are ride or die with me. I actually had a medium come just for fun. A friend of mine had a medium come. She was like, this medium just blew me away. Well, medium Nigel, who's been on my podcast, came over and descri- physically described my dad's parents to the letter. And I was like, there's no way. He walked into my podcast studio. There's nothing of my grandparents anywhere on the planet. He didn't even know my last name. So there's no way he could have Googled it. I don't even know if there's any pictures of my dad's parents online. But I was very, very soul close to both of them. My soul was Mm. close to both of them. And I missed them very much. Mm. And I just was like, I'll be damned. I knew they were here. And they would never have come to California. (laughs) We are not going out there with them crazy people. No, they would never have come here. Although my grandmother did come here once to visit. but, But they're here. And I think they're with me all the time. And you know, my other house, I built a huge rose garden. And my grandmother grew roses in Georgia, and that's very difficult. Uh, Roses don't do well in Georgia. Oh, no kidding. No, you have to have an exceptional green thumb to make roses thrive there. So I built this whole rose garden for my grandmother. That's so moving to me. And I think that it, I think she comes to see me a lot. Because not just because of me, but because of that rose garden. I think she's I love that. there all the time. I love that so much. And I want her there all the time. Cause talk about direct. Oh there yeah. Was no one more Grandma direct. Was no bullshit. She never talked. <gasps> but when she did, it was like bam. And you're like, oh <laughs> shit. You've been listening this whole time. I'm a talker. She ne- hardly ever talked. And then all of a sudden she'd be like, well, you know, you know that man, he's got to have a woman or he just can't make it. And then you're like, what? Where have you been? And just all the wisdom. just yes. boom, And it's right. Yeah. And she's 100% right. My grandma was like that, too. Was she? She would she would also say things of very much of her generation. So, you know, things that maybe not, weren't necessarily useful, like 
when she she when I was little, she would like comb my hair, and if I had a snarl, and she'd hit the snarl, and I say, "Ow, Grandma!" She goes, "That's the price we pay to be a woman." <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, "That's kind of fucked up." But I mean, right. okay. Or you could I just go point. easier on the brush. How about that? <laughs> How about start at the bottom of the knot and work your way up? What's no, wrong, Grandma? Like, <laughs> I know, right? Uh, until it came out. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> No, she's God. That was really cool. Yeah, I was super close with my grandparents too. Oh, me too. So too. close with them. I was too. My grandma was five feet. My grandpa was six four. Oh, that's adorable. Isn't that adorable? Oh my God, that must have been cutest funny. Ever. It was the cutest thing ever. And he was built like Bert, but six four. Like oh my gosh, not no so belly, funny. but just enormous. Like yeah. Bert's shoulders are like two two yeah, three feet he's like wide. Jacked. He's huge. Yeah. This is my grandpa's. It's huge mountain of a man and she's a teeny tiny little well you're an itty bitty little thing too if she's smaller than me yeah she was five four yeah Mm. she's five feet real tiny she was a little bitty little thing that's so cute so yeah the medium was like there's an enormous man and a very tiny woman here and i went "Mm." he's wearing odd clothes and i went like overalls and he goes yeah i think so (sighs) was he a farmer yeah Uh they were farmers yeah yeah he had cattle and they um, raised or grew every just about everything we ate. Um, oh, that's so cool! And it cool traded yeah. like with the dairy farm down the street um, for um, dairy. Sometimes and they bu- did you butcher your own? Mm-hmm. Oh man, you are like red dirt girl, aren't red you? Red dirt girl, that's right. We you saw really Emmy are. Lou last night. Red dirt girl, that's right. Yeah, um, yeah. It was a pretty crazy way to grow up. I rang chickens' necks. I I burst goats. Uh, like wow. put my hand in a goat and pull a baby goat out. Um, yeah, I'm a you real are, true farmer. You're sturdy. <laughs> you I am are so sturdy. Sturdy. Sob <laughs> layer. I am. I think people think when I when people find out I'm from Nebraska, they presume that my experience was more was cattle was more like that. Yeah, yeah. I'm like no. What was it like in Nebraska? It was well. I grew up in Omaha, so mm. it was like the in big, the city. It was the big city. Okay. You know, I mean, big city, but um, it was much more of a you know your typical sort of suburban experience than like farmland or or stuff like that mm-hmm. you know Omaha's beautiful you know what it was a great place to grow up I, I I felt safe I felt loved I had a good education I also as I was getting older especially because of what was going on with my mom too I started to feel the the parameters of it mm-hmm. in a way that I never did growing up it mm-hmm. didn't I was never one of those kids who's like I gotta get out of here right I don't belong you know what I mean yeah. I I was I was happy and right. I have a really great family and would have loved to have stayed close to them. But when I sort of had that moment with my mom, when I was like, I either chase this dream or I just accept that it's never going to happen and I'm here. And so when that took me in a different direction, I realized, okay, I love you, Omaha. I wish I could be here to mm-hmm. raise my children in a community where I already have my people, but I have to go find someplace else. Yeah. Are so. you still uh, friends with people back in Omaha? Oh, or? yeah. Yeah, that's I have great. this group of girlfriends from high school that we, you know, everybody went off and had their own lives for many, many, many years. Mm-hmm. And I had kept in touch with like maybe two or three of my closest friends. Mm-hmm. But then in the last few years, right before the pandemic, as a matter of fact, we'd been texting and everybody was like, oh, we should get together someday. And I finally said, I just bought myself a ticket to Vegas. These are the dates. Be there. Amazing. And it started a thing where every January on, it's usually over MLK weekend, we all meet somewhere. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's turned out to be, and we have this group text thread that is like, it's so cool to have these girlfriends back in my life. And now we're like, before we were like, what party are we going to? Or who's designated driver tonight? You know, those were the old conversation. Now it's like, so are you guys sweating at night? You know, like, <laughs> yes, just, like, I do. These are, these are the conversations right. that are starting now. And to have that, like, I don't know, we're all completely different, but all exactly the same. It's a super safe group, right? Yeah, I think so. I got reconnected with my middle school best friend. Oh, and, uh, you know, we put our dog down the other night. Yeah, I'm so sorry. And that's OK. She was old. She was 17. She was suffering. She had a good life. And she had a wonderful life. And we were happy to let her go. She, yeah. We were happy to give her the privilege of being let go yes um but the next day becky texted me and she's like oh my god mona okay so if i live there i would show up today with the following snacks 
Pop Tarts, <laughs> Rice Krispie Treats, uh, Dr. Pepper. It was like everything I ate in middle school. And we would watch Joe Millionaire all day. Oh. That's what we would do today. And I was like, how do you not love this human being who knows me so well? And that's, that's I don't have time to do that. But it just meant the world to me. I had a, I have a friend who she and I are actually working on a project together about about girls who are besties in like middle school mm -hmm. that right there. And she wrote something that was so beautiful. She said, our best friends from that era of our life are like the pages of our diary walking around in the world. Wow. That's a great thing. Isn't to that say. gorgeous? Yes. Yeah. Jenny wrote that. And I was like, we have to write about this. We have to talk about this because it's so it's magical. Uh huh. It's a magical time. The things they know about you that you've forgotten yeah. about yourself. Totally. Uh, you know what? You are so right. I talked to her recently. Um, we had a long, just long talk on the phone one day uh, about who we were back in those days. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I ever really felt seen until I was oh. pretty old in life, until I was probably not joking well into my 30s. Really? I never felt seen only by my dad. I felt seen by my dad, right. but not really by anybody else. Um, I, n I never felt like anybody got me. I never felt like any anybody understood me. And I never had good girlfriends until my 30s. Mm. I always had oh, guy friends. Me. Oh, no, I never had girlfriends until my 30s. I don't like the, I, I don't, I didn't trust women very easily because uh -huh. of the, the, my experience of women in the 20s was it, they were all on the hunt for the husband. Right. So you were competition. And yes, or I'm not on the hunt for the husband. I'm oh. on the hunt for self. Oh, and husband right, will right, show right. up where they're just on hunt for husband. And I'm like, well, I that's don't boring. I understand that. <laughs> I don't know what to talk to you about. Like, I don't, I don't get a bikini wax for a husband. I get a bikini wax because I'm going to the beach. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, that was my kind yeah. of different mentality. So I just didn't, I felt very lost. Uh, for a long time mm -hmm. and like I had no place no I didn't belong mm -hmm. anywhere mm -hmm. um and when we talked she just went you were the most loyal person I've ever known in my entire life this is how you were a friend to me you were always there when I was upset you were the only person I wanted to spend time with when you would go to your dad's every other weekend I would spend the whole weekend miserable because you weren't here <sighs> because you were my best friend I've never known anybody like you I've never had another friend. And I was like, I didn't know she felt all these things. I had no idea. I was like, wow. I had this moment of really belonging. No wonder I felt this absence of belonging. Of course. All through high school, all through college, all through my 20s, because I belonged to her in middle school. And then she moved. Oh, God. And I, I lost her. so... I relate to that. Do so, you? Oh my God. Yes. It's just that it's, and it's the same thing. I feel like I say to my boys all the time, you just got to find your people. Yep. And when you have a, a person. Yep. And then you have a period of time that you don't. Wow. Yeah. That's really destabilizing. Yeah, it did. It made me go, well, I don't, I, she was, she was my person mm -hmm. uh, in my whole childhood. She was my person. She chose me and I chose her mm. and then her family chose to move. And so I lost her. And then I moved to my dad's. And then we were like two and a half hour drive away from each other. And you're in high and school. And you're a kid. Like it's not. Yeah. No way. I can't get to her. She can't get to me. It's a lot to ask a parent to drive for two and a half hours. It's a lot. So we just, we faded away. Well, how did you guys reconnect then? Facebook. Oh. She found The one me. good thing. It's the one thing. It's good exactly. The one thing it is good for is reconnecting people. She found me on Facebook like many, probably 20 years ago. Um. Which sounds like that might be when I was in middle school, but no, alas, <laughs> that was more like 40 years ago. But yeah, she found me about 20 years ago and we kept in touch just once every six months, uh, not much at all. And it's, as the years have grown and we've gotten older, I think we've, and reflecting on your life, uh -huh. look at where those valuable connections were, you know, mm -hmm. I still don't talk to her very often. But it's those key moments in life. She was the first text message I got that morning after I had posted on Instagram that Mona had passed away. She was the first person who texted me with, I would show up with Pop-Tarts and Rice Krispie Treats and Dr. You Pepper. know what that makes me think of? What? 
when you were telling me about the letter that Georgia left you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Georgia said, this is a core memory for me now. Yeah. It's like you have core memories with Becky. this friend. Yeah, yeah. With Becky. I do a lot of them. You know? Yeah. She had bull master. Oh. That's a big ass dog. Isn't it? Aren't they big? Huge. They're kind of awesome. They're very sweet. I love those dogs. Do you have dogs? Cats? Um, I had a dog growing up. I had a Maltese named Snowy. And then my dad went through like kind of a kind of a thing when my mom got sick and he got a Vietnamese pot belly pig and named it Kevin Bacon. <laughs> Kevin Bacon. <laughs> so I had Kevin Bacon for a little while. That's that hysterical. A, that was a moment. So clearly your dad has a sense of humor. He has a good sense of humor. That's yes, awesome. Yes. He's, he's so like, if you saw him, he has like the most stoic sort of like, he almost looks angry face. And then he'll like th throw out a zinger and he'll be like, oh, you're not intimidating and mean. You're funny. That's funny. Um, But yeah, I love dogs. But my family is the boys now. I have, I have tried to get a puppy so many times and we have a cat. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, we don't like dogs. We want a cat. So they're cat people. So we have a cat. Yeah. I'm as a cat person too. I'm a little obsessed with my cat. It might oh, be a little unhealthy. I've seen your cat now that I she think about is, it. She's gorgeous. Yeah, she is <laughs> she's gorgeous. She's a beauty. She's a little, she's, she's maybe carrying a little extra weight right now. And the vet was like, we really should, should probably lose a pound or two. And I'm like, but, but she's hungry. <laughs> let a girl <laughs> eat. Like, let's let her alone. Let a girl eat. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay it's okay that's so funny yeah so anyway what's the hardest part about being an actress what do you like the least <sighs> that's a really good question I'll tell you what I like the least about what it does to me internally okay it makes me uh, it triggers all that um hyper like hypercritical superficial part of my brain. Mm -hmm. I, I'm to this. I'm not enough that I'm just like, and I can get really hung up on that. And mm -hmm. I'm sure that's, you know, a leftover from watching a mother with an eating disorder and sort of the values that were put on, you know? So, so that's the part that it does to me internally that I dislike the most. Mm -hmm. Um, the industry itself, um, what do I dislike the most? I dislike the hierarchy. Mm. Um, because I come from theater. Mm -hmm. That's where I started my career. And the majority of my career was on Broadway and all of that mm -hmm. for, for many, many years. And there's an innate sense of ensemble. Mm -hmm. uh, even if you're, you know, even if you don't have any lines uh, and you're just singing and dancing in the chorus, you're in the same theater, on the same stage, every single day with the people who are, you know, the stars. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? When I was working with Hugh Jackman, mm -hmm. he had his star dressing room and everything, but he was on stage with us. He was a part of the, do you know what I mean? It was, mm -hmm. it was a very, like, we're all equal here. Yeah, if, like a softball you're team. Not. Like a softball like team. Like a softball team. Yeah. Right. Which I've never played on, but I assume yeah, it's but the same. No, but everybody's important. Right. Even if you're on the bench, you're supposed to be loud and talking to the team. Exactly. So everybody's essential. And you essential. support one another yes. and it's a collective yes. group, group effort. Which it, is not to say that film and television aren't also very much a, a group effort. Sure. But there's something around the idea of who's number one on the call sheet and who's... Oh. Do you know what I mean? There's mm -hmm. just a, a lot of that that um, is interesting because in my career, I've had the unbelievable honor of working with Martin Scorsese a couple of times now. Mm -hmm. Actually, three times now. That's amazing. And I know. What the fuck? That's crazy. Me? Yeah, you. Steph. Well, yeah, you. From Omaha. Because like, you're a fucking amazing actress. Well, <laughs> Stop. You are. You're really great. <laughs> Everything I've ever Thank seen you. you do, I'm like, I cannot believe she's so good. Oh, Because you don't God. even look like you're acting. Oh. You're just there. You're being that person. You're You've embodied that person. All the right things to me right no, now. No, <laughs> but that no, that is what it is. Thank you. I can't forget it's you because I know you. Yeah. But I go, wow, she's really like this character is totally different than the Wolf of Wall Street, oh. which is totally different from Leanne Crusher, which is totally different from Blue Bloods. They're all completely different and unique human beings. You've I embodied love you and so created. Much. No, it's exactly That's so generous of true. you to say that. I'm just direct. <laughs> As you know, we've determined, my, my brother was my brother was watching. Uh, I I did an episode of The Watcher. Did you see that one? No. The Ryan Murphy. I only mention it because I played a, I, I was just a miserable drunk. Oh God, which was super fun. Well, now I have to watch it. Oh my God, it's, it's one episode. You can hit it and quit it. But um, 
Uh, my brother and I was like real foul mouth and stuff in it. My brother said he was like, I was watching this show and this just drunk oh my God. witch comes on. And I'm like, oh, she's why is her voice so familiar? He was like, oh, my God, it's my sister. <laughs> what like, a great compliment. I know. Well, I was also like, were you drinking? Because like, how did you not recognize me? But um, no, but there's but back to to the question, the hierarchy um, thing being on Marty sets, there's a certain uh, familial feeling that like that stuff exists tremendously. I mean, there are the most famous people on those sets and yet it doesn't, you don't feel it. Mm -hmm. um, but then I've been on multiple other sets, which are, the stakes are considerably, I don't want to say lower because I don't want to devalue certain things, but they're not as high profile. Sure. Right. And, and I have been like, treated like garbo why I'm not garbo garbage i'm just talking like my children hot, garbo's fine garbo. hot garbo is what garbo. my son says hot that means garbo. hot garbage i love that hot garbo oh, i'm totally garbo. stealing that <laughs> so it's it's interesting because it's like oh well you're just the the guest star and you know and that part i really dislike because i come from a world where like hey we're all playing on the same team mm -hmm. nobody needs to fawn over me you know what i mean mm -hmm. nobody needs to help me on to set or you know what I mean there's there's sometimes there's some of that and mm -hmm. I'm like this is like kind of performative isn't it yeah can we all just like show up and do the scene and talk to each exactly. other like actors you exactly. know exactly or like people I've had that <laughs> experience a like lot people. too as you go up this um ladder of success yeah the the world of stand-up comedy is pretty base human amazing people that are Lucky just you. people we're just people there's no jockeying. The, my experience of the community of stand-up comics is that, <clears throat> for the most part, they root for each other. They're all underdogs in their own right. You know, a stand-up comic is is an underdog. I think sometimes uh, to get into, quote, traditional Hollywood is really difficult for a stand-up because they're seen only as that performative person. <laughs> You know? Right, right. So, like in the '80s, it happened all the time. Eddie Murphy does a great stand-up special, and there's Beverly Hills Cop, and there's you know, down all these right. movies that came out of it. And I don't know. Same with who? Robin Williams came from stand-up. Billy mm -hmm. Crystal came from stand-up. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve Martin came from stand-up. Uh, we haven't really seen that happening in a long time. No, there's, I feel like Ray Romano and his like right around there was kind of yep, Tim Seinfeld. Allen. Tim mm -hmm. Allen. That was kind of the Roseanne. last mm -hmm. Seinfeld. Kevin. Um, Hart? Kevin, no, he's great. At the Kevin James. Yep. I'm thinking of like that was yeah. kind of that was like nineties. Yes, the nineties. Cause mm -hmm. it kind of doesn't happen much anymore. Doesn't happen much anymore. And so um as we've transitioned for the film into traditional Hollywood, I I you know, in comedy, sell the ticket. I don't mm -hmm. care who's selling it. I don't care whose idea it is. I don't care if the janitor at the venue said, right. hey, how about this great idea? We would go right on. Let's do it. That has not been my experience <laughs> in traditional <laughs> Hollywood. No. It's all about who gets credit for what and what does that credit card mean and breaking. I'm like, who gives a shit? Isn't the point that you made something good? You would think, right? You and would that think, we did no. it together? I don't think they play softball in Hollywood. No, I think you're right. I think, I think they're all playing golf. I, oh. You know what I mean? They're all about themselves. Even that is the hottest analogy. I think we need to make that a thing. Yeah, I think I it play, is a thing. I play softball, not golf. I'm a softball player. I don't care who scores the run. Yes. Are we winning the game? That's all I care about. Right. And I don't believe golfers play like that. I don't play golf, but. That's my analogy is that my experience is that we're a softball team showing up to a golf match and we don't really understand mm. how to function mm. in this golf game. Maybe you don't need to. Maybe you just because I mean, listen, maybe not. I think what everybody loves about you, about Bert, is this. They are so relatable. They could be my friends. Well, they yeah. are because you are. You're just like you're who you are. 100%. And then you also happen to have a camera on you talking as you and that people like that. Right, right. right maybe don't ever, ever pick up a golf club. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> don't worry. That's been my biggest problem here is that I keep going, yeah, I don't want that golf club. I have a bat 
Yeah. Can we just knock the shit out of a ball? You know, know. no finesse. I love that. Though. Just knock it. <laughs> Let's just go. keep doing it your way. I'll slide into the dirt all and if day. It, <laughs> if it stops, and if it stops working at some point, then you know, then yeah, reassess. Yeah, yeah. But right now, I mean, if it ain't broke, it's not broke, and not. I don't think we're. It's not broke over here. We we get stuff done. So I'm surprised that anything gets done in, in Hollywood. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, and I'm not just talking about the. Uh, I'm I'm talking about the whole experience of film, television, streaming service. The everything that's not on a live stage is such a different ball of wax. Yeah, it's, it's not one person I'm talking about. I'm talking about the whole industry, Hollywood. Yeah traditional Hollywood ball of wax is yeah. is a head scratcher for me. Well, I think it's interesting that you say that because I think I think the whole traditional thing is I think we're in the throes of of I don't know if it's a demise, I, that's too strong of a word, but it is definitely a oh, paradigm shift. Do I Indeed. sound like an asshole from corporate? No. But I do feel like we're in, you know, technology uh-huh. has affected this industry uh-huh. indelibly. And now everybody's trying to like I don't know. Kind of reminds me of the Republicans and the Democrats. Like the Democrats <laughs> are still playing the old game and Republicans yeah. are kind of playing a new one. And I was like, y'all got to play on the same field or else nothing's going to get done. It's so true. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm not not trying to be political. I'm not no. like, tipping my hat towards one or the other. I'm just saying they're playing different games. And you got to work together. And if you don't. Yeah. Like, you know, it's not a democracy, no problems get solved. That's right. So, so. so hard. It's so hard. All right. Yeah. Anyway. Um, what is your the hardest part of being a parent? Damn, girl, with the hard balls. When we identify the hard parts, we can adjust, right? We can adjust our paradigm. We can. Yeah. And I think and I think the hard part is different for different stages. 100 percent. Right. I agree. 100 percent. So I would say that currently the hardest part for me is allowing the separation mm. that needs to happen because of the ages where my my boys are. Mm-hmm. Um, because they're then, teenagers. They're teenagers. Yeah. God damn, I have two teenagers. I know How'd that happened. I don't know. Oh my God, Dexter's going to be a freshman next year, That's and I'm going to have two high schoolers. That's crazy. But l- allowing the allowing the natural distance and separation that must occur for them to be able to launch successfully into the world. Uh huh. And the I've always prized the closeness that I've shared with my children. And like maybe I've been a little too self congratulatory <laughs> as it turns out, <laughs> because um, they need to separate and go their own way. Yeah. Man, it's hurting my fucking feelings. Isn't it hard? Yeah, and I keep reminding myself it's not about you, Steph. Yeah. It's not about you right now. You it's know what? what? Need. Someone gave me this piece of advice that was really good, and it sucks at the same time. Hmm. What they need from you when they are teenagers is for you to be an air fern. An air fern only needs air. You don't need to do anything for it or to it or about it. But you're in the room and you're in the corner and they always know the fern is over there. That's what you have to be when they're teenagers. Now, obviously, from time to time, when they get too off the rails, you have to step in and go, hey, 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 remember our value system here? This Uh is where we're lining up. We're not doing that anymore. But for the most part, your job is to be an air fern so that they, because... I, I'm making this analysis. She just told me the air fern and then my brain goes. Sure. Right. 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 So in the. I was like, oh, OK, because what's happening is if you don't allow them autonomy, they're going to take it in ways that aren't healthy. So if you allow it in ways, if you allow it, if you just step back and be the air fern and go, you do you, buddy, you do you love you. And then once they get a little too far off to the left or right, you kind of are bumpers and put them back on track. That's all you can do. And it's so terrible because they don't (laughs) need you. They don't want you. Mm -hmm. They don't care about you. This is what it feels Feels like. like. Right. It's not not true. No. But 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 what they're doing is healthily separating. Mm -hmm. Of course, obviously, if kids are off the rails and doing drugs and smoking shit and you know yeah ba- right. i'm not talking about bad behavior i'm talking about regular teenager yeah. i love you don't talk to me kind of thing yeah or i'll, I'll be in my room like don't you want to hang out and they don't 
They don't. And then you're like, huh, what's what wrong with I me? Do? And what did I do? And what's I wrong know. with me? We used to love to put puzzles together. What do you mean at 16 you, you don't want to put a puzzle together with your mom? <laughs> I, I can't know. believe you're Why out you puzzling. All about your day. Why won't you tell me in depth about everything? I know, right? Every interaction you had. Yes. I know. Air fern. Gotta just be an air fern. Oh, that's so good. I'm going to take that and I will try to remember to be the air fern. And, you know, a, a lot of it, too, is like I recognize that with the autonomy and uh, I get real triggered. I have PTSD from losing my mom. It's something I continue oh, I to work on. And imagine, you yeah. know, it, it happened very suddenly and then it was a super intense period. And I'm still I'm still triggered by things like them being with people I don't know and, and 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 potentially in a dangerous situation because, you know, 16, at 16, I get a phone call, your mom's gone for all intents and purposes, like that, like, hunk. so now I'm like, if you're out of my sight and I can't control and I don't know who you're with and I don't know where with, that's really triggering yeah, for me, totally. for the PTSD. So I, I, I recognize that this moment is like, it's it's a two-headed monster for me. It it's is. the natural, normal, like parent stuff of like, well, I want to hang out with me. But also the like, <gasps> And the outsize, uh, like, physiological reaction mm -hmm. to what I perceive as potential danger. Totally. You know, which is... Well, you know, they say the mark of emotional paternity is to be able to hold two feelings at the same time and know that they are connected yet separate. Oh, is that right? And that's what you just described. So I'm emotionally mature now, you, officially? You are very emotionally mature because you're <laughs> able to go... Do I get a go, certificate? This is happening now. <laughs> This happened a long time ago and is waking up because of this is happening now. So mm -hmm. I'm going to hold them both. And that's emotional maturity. Huh. So, or that's what my therapist said. I like that, though. She told me that a long time ago. Uh, she was like, that is the mark of emotional maturity. And that's where you should be as a human being, is to know you're to know that I'm, this is not now. This is trigger. Right, right. This is... So that you can separate It's them. not that it's not real. No, it's 100% it, real. It is real. It's just uh, maybe not as relevant mm -hmm. As it feels. It's modified real. Modified. Augmented reality. Augmented reality. <laughs> that's what it is. Yeah. So that's good that you you see those two things. That's really healthy. Why for the Party this week is brought to you by Manscaped. Everybody knows I love Manscaped. I use their products myself. I love the grooming tool because I don't... I see maybe it's TMI, but I don't like being bikini waxed. I'd much rather trim up just like a guy would do with this manscape tool. So I use it for myself. I also really like their body wash because I don't like girly smelling stuff. I like um, kind of more musky smell and I love their body wash. It's so great. Father's Day is coming up. What better thing to give the guy in your life than ultimate excellent grooming tools and supplies? Let's start with the ultimate Father's Day MVP, the beard Hedger Pro Kit. Inside this package, you'll find their signature beard hedger trimmer, beard shampoo, plus conditioner, beard oil, beard balm, and two free gifts with their signature beard comb and scissors. With 20 hair cutting links and a singular guard, he'll be able to craft his look like never before without mess in the drawers. Something we ladies can all appreciate. And if he doesn't have a beard, he needs to try their Performance Package 4.0. This beautiful bundle is absolutely daddy material. It includes their signature lawnmower 4.0, brand new Weed Whacker 2.0 ear and nose hair trimmer, Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, Crop Reviver Toner, Performance Boxer Briefs, and a travel bag to hold all his goodies. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code WOTP at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code WOTP. Make this Father's Day one he won't forget with Manscaped. Wife of the Party today is brought to you by True Classic. Okay, one of Bert's biggest complaints is I would take my kids to Target and let them buy him Father's Day presents. And they would always buy the most hideous T-shirt you've ever seen on the planet. And he would get so upset with me because it would be either A, dorky, B, ill-fitting, C, not good quality. And it would make him so upset. 
True Classic has the solution for the dad in your life. You finally have an excuse to throw away his baggy, boxy tees. If there's one thing these guys are good at, it's a great fitting t-shirt for guys of all shapes and sizes. True Classic shirts are ultra soft and fitted in the arms and shoulders with just enough room where they need it for the perfect fit and feel every time. Gift more for less on bundled packs of button downs, Henleys, polos, and more styles he'll want to wear on repeat, guaranteed. But it doesn't stop there. From their latest comfort jeans and chinos to no-ride boxer briefs, True Classic is your one-stop shop for all his wardrobe needs, bringing that same dedication to fit and feel to everything else he needs to get dressed. True Classic is hooking our listeners up with an exclusive deal to help you get ahead on gifting. For limited time only, get 25% off with the code WOTP at trueclassic.com. That's 25% off with code WOTP plus free shipping included on purchases over $100. What do you think the hardest thing about parenting is? Um... Right now, in the moment right now, it is letting them go. And I feel like I have let Georgia go, but it's it's causing grief for me. Yeah. I'm happy oh. for it, but it's making me sad. Oh. And, and it's making, you have to grieve. You know, it is the end of Their an childhood. era. Yeah. It's an end of a, a chapter is a great way to put it for us. It's the beginning of a new one, mm-hmm. but we're in transition. You know, I, it's not really... It is the beginning of a new one, but we're still figuring out what that is. And she definitely um, keeps me at arm's length. And then I have to still allow her to set the pace. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not Mm -hmm. my pace. It's got to be her pace. Right. Because she's building this autonomy as a young adult. So the grief part is really hard for me right now. Um, What was hard earlier, I think, was... um, was taking a moment to see my children as who they were and not just parent in a broad stroke. Mm. Is to stop and look at the long game of that child, right? So if Isla's a hitter, she's hit everybody until she's four years old. And to not be like, I got to break her from hitting. I got to make her stop hitting and to go, why is she hitting? Mm -hmm. What makes her, that's how she, oh, okay. That's how she communicates. She's not verbally communicating. Uh She's a physical communicator. Long term, what does that get her in life? Or what does that, what problems does that cause for her in life? And how do I address the now to positively affect the later? Damn, girl. That's what I did when they were younger. And it was You need a you need a you need to be on your own tour talking about this stuff. <laughs> like giving workshops, like TED Talk or some I shit. I don't know. All I know is my mom needed me to fit in a box this big, uh, which I never fit in, mm. and she could only see that box this mm-hmm. big. And so when I had kids, I was like, I will not do that to my children. I will see who they are and try to figure out how to maximize who they are for positive growth. Mentoring. You're right. It was a mentor. It was about because I would see Eileen go, okay, she's a hitter. She's physical. Here's what I know about her. She's going to need to work out. She's going to need to be in some kind of sport. Uh huh. She's going to be moving her body. Yeah. And she doesn't, words don't come naturally. So when she was hitting, I would go, I wouldn't say, you're angry because that takes the power away from her. Mm-hmm. I would that go, takes away her experience. what are you feeling? Mm-hmm. Are you angry? Are you frustrated? Are you, are you uh, ups- upset? Are you um, scared? Tell me, tell me what of these. And she would always find the word I gave her. Mm -hmm. And I could see it in her eyes where she got it. And I was like, this is my path for her is I have to train her to speak verbally because she lives in a world where she will have to communicate verbally. Right. Her wants, her needs, her feelings. Right. That's my journey for her. And, and. That was hard because in the moment I'd be like, just stop hitting, you know, just stop it. Yeah. And it was a long game playing that long game was really hard, I think, in the beginning because it's super easy to just parent the moment, you know. Yes, and I think, and I think that's the major. I mean, it's uh, it ultimately it's being reactive uh, than yeah. proactive, right? Completely, yeah, yeah. And that's like, I mean, that's a that's a great lesson in every relationship to try yeah. and 
you know? You're right. Josh and I figured that out pretty early in our relationship because we both, we'd start reacting off the other's reaction and it'd be like, wait, how, what, where are we? How yeah. did we get here? <laughs> now we don't even know you what know? we're talking like, about. Don't even know. Yeah. Don't yeah. even know what we were talking about. Yeah. You know? How did you meet Josh? I went down to, this is a cute story. So I was hired to do a play in Houston, in Texas. Um, and I went down to the Alley Theater and he was, he was a, one of the first people I met when I walked through the doors of the theater and somebody introduced him to me. He was the props carpenter for the theater. So he worked in the shop and built everything for the stage. And this, the person who introduced us said, oh, this is Josh. Josh, this is Stephanie. And then he said hi and he walked away. And she said to me, oh, you know, you, Josh is great. He's a really good dancer. And I, so being from New York City and having had a musical theater career, I was like, oh, he's gay. <laughs> I was like, that's code, right? I speak that language. I know I know what that means. He's a dancer. Okay. I said, damn, he's cute, but all right. So fast forward a few weeks and I see him out and stuff and at the theater and we chat and we have a nice rapport and he walks into the bar one night after the show and he kind of comes up to me and goes, what are you up to tonight? And I was like, oh, I'm just, you know, hanging out. So what are you up to? And he goes, looking for trouble. <gasps> and I was like, this gay guy is really flirty. <laughs> Sweet. Okay. Like whoosh, straight over my head. Oh, so funny. And um, and I was doing. I was in the middle of a show, doing a, like a a quick change, like literally, like you know, thirty seconds to a different character, wig, outfit, the whole night. And the girl who was helping me out, and she said, "Oh, a bunch of us are going out tonight. Do you want to come have drinks?" I was like, "Oh, yeah. Who's going to be there?" She's like, "Oh, well, well, Josh is going to be there, um, you know, because he's he's he just recently went through a divorce." And I went. To a man or a woman? Oh, my God. And she was like, she started laughing hysterically. She was like, a woman. And I was like, I have been misled. <laughs> <laughs> and I literally, I literally said in my head, it was like that Wayne's World moment. I was like, it will be mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. And um, and th that's that's how we met. And he thought that was the funniest story he'd ever heard. And that is really funny. And we hung out. Oh, this reminds me of your first date with Bert. Yeah. The first night that we like hung out, he was like, we were at like a group function and after the show and he said, uh, do you want to come back and listen to music at my apartment? I was like, yeah, sure. So we're sitting there and he's playing. So and it's getting later and I'm like, is this guy going to make a move? Right? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> and he's like, I mean, and he must have been nervous, right? Because he's like telling me, and when I worked at, I worked at Home Depot for a little while. <laughs> he's like, oh. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? And I finally like, like lost, like lost my filter and I was like, cool. Well, I got to go. I was like, so are you going to kiss me before I leave or what? And he just went, oh, um, yeah. And our wedding bands, mm -hmm. um, his says, uh, are you going to kiss me before I leave? Uh. And mine says, oh, um, yeah. I love it. Isn't that cute? Yes. Yeah. That's amazing. But Aww. it kind of reminds me of yours where you're like, What's going on, bro? Yeah, like, come on, come on now. Make a move. That's adorable. <laughs> I love that your wedding rings say that. That's yeah. amazing. It's good, right? Yes, that is good. I can't read it anymore. I need glasses <laughs> to be able to read it now. But right. <laughs> we were at the comedy store the other night, and Bert's working on new material, and he told this joke. Uh, after we'd had Isla, I think maybe, um, I had this realization. He was on the road, and I just got really bummed. And I couldn't figure out why. And in my self-reflection, I was like, I'm never going to have another first kiss. And although uh -oh. I love my husband and I don't want a first kiss, I, that makes me really sad because there's oh. so many wonderful things that the anticipation and is he going to kiss me? Is he going to kiss me now? Yeah, and what's it going to be like? And then what is it like? And there's all these feelings that happen. It's amazing. And that's never, ever going to happen for me ever, ever, ever again. Oh man. I'm <laughs> it was old. called postpartum. I, was, I think it was <laughs> called postpartum. So I called Bert and told him that. And he, he goes, yeah, thank God. There's nothing worse than a first kiss. I mean, there's so much pressure on a guy it's terrible. Does she want me to? Does she want, want me to? And is it going to suck? She's going to think oh, it sucks. She's going to like judge everything on this kiss. Oh my God. I was like, that's what happens for you? And he goes, so it's horrible. First kiss is the worst. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. I did not know that. Such opposite experiences. Right? Oh my God. Isn't that crazy? 
I mean, it tracks no burden. <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? I'm like, okay, yeah. But I wonder yeah. if a lot of guys feel that way. You know, I've, I, it's interesting because I've thought about that as the boys are getting older, uh, just thinking about whoever their first kiss is with. It, it's still, I think societally, it still feels a little bit like there's pressure on the man. Yeah. To sort of, you know. Initiate. Initiate. And I'm like, well, that must suck. Yeah. I wonder how I prepare them to feel confident enough to and be smart enough to understand consent and all of that. Yeah, so, right? You know what I mean? Because there's a lot of that is such a nuanced. Mm -hmm. And as as a woman, I never even a straight woman specifically, I never like it never even occurred to me like me that that's pressure on them. Never thought of it. Yeah, I, I thought I never thought of it. But so it's, it's interesting perspective. It's amazing how different men and women are. Yeah, in it some is ways, wild. Um, not to be gender whatever yeah divisive or whatever the uh, term is these days but back in the day for <laughs> we gen xers man you know it was i had no idea that it, that pressure was there i honestly i hadn't even thought of it either i mean after all the john hughes movies where it was just date rape was happening all the time apparently you know Dude, what i mean <laughs> i have shared so many of my my oh my god you guys have to see this I film know. oh you're going to love it and i'm like <laughs> Like needle off a fucking record, like that's really <laughs> that did not age well. Do you know what I mean? I do. Uh, well, I stood up and I showed the girls Blazing Saddles. Oh fuck! Josh so did that. He <laughs> did. <laughs> I stood in front of the TV and went, "Today we are going to watch a movie. Let me explain to you what you are about to see." I fucking right. love you so much because Josh showed it to the boys and I had a conniption fit. <laughs> And I went, you cannot show them that movie yeah. without a conversation exactly. around race before. I was like, right. what the fuck are you doing? Like, he was like, what? Oh, uh, 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 I yeah. love you and I are the same fucking person. I know. Right. I literally I went, you were like, this movie breaks <laughs> down all barriers of racism. <laughs> he basically calls out racism for every race. So he is actually saying, hey, look how stupid this is. So I don't want you to think I'm showing you a movie. Yes, it needs that context. That is a proponent of racism. It this is a, the God opposite of that. And when it was over, they were like, that was the best movie. And I'm like, exactly. Exactly. Because you have a, context, yes. a modern context yes. for it. Oh, my God. And you can see the ridiculousness, ridiculousness. He made fun of everybody right. in that movie. Right. And then... It's, it wasn't accidental. It wasn't just throwing exactly. around r racist terminology. It was exactly. making a point. It was, it was. satirizing. It, it was, was, you know. Josh did the same thing. He tried. He was like, I think I'm going to show the boys the Bond movies. I was like, the fuck you are. <laughs> you made the objectification like, of yeah, women. Well, let's babies. talk about, yeah, let's make it yeah. about women's boobs on a beach, Josh. What are you thinking? Totally. And, and he was like, oh, right. I'm like, yeah. Again, is that like parenting by rote? Uh huh. Like I enjoyed this, so like, you know. And then I watched all the Bond stuff. movies with my dad. I'm like this is problematic. And my dad was like, "In this great action movie with boobies." You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I guess I'm supposed to look like that, but I'm not sure that's right. actually genetically that seems, possible. Yeah, I was like, that seems out of reach for exactly. me. <laughs> I don't look like that anywhere. I don't oh, even man. have her elbow. Like, I don't look like any of that. You know, my earlobe might be in line oh with her God. earlobe. Other than that, I'm out of luck. Oh, my Lord. Uh, anyway, <laughs> parenting such an interesting journey, isn't it? How has it informed your acting or has it? Oh, my God. I mean, well, here's the thing. I, I don't know if I can say um, specifically how it has informed it, but I, I, I can tell you this. Parenting in general has made me such a better person. Mm hmm um, and I think any time you are engaged in the practice of growing your humanity, you by necessity become a better artist. Right. You know what I mean? I do. Uh, the more you know yourself, the more you understand yourself, even if you are playing a character completely unlike yourself, mm -hmm. having a, a human experience to draw upon mm -hmm. uh, for any circumstance, whether it's uh, a circumstance you've lived through or not, there's... There's a there's a component, a building block of of human experience that can be utilized mm -hmm. if I'm playing. You know, I'm thankful to say I've never been an alcoholic, but I had to play one. Sure. So what is it about addiction and all of that that I can pull from? Mm -hmm. um, and so therefore, 
being a parent has just filled me right. with experiences and, you know. Probably com complex emotions, probably more complex emotions than a single person. At least that's the way parenting has been for me. Yes. Is the emotions are very complex. Yes, because again, like emotional maturity, you have to be able to hold multiple things as true at once. Mm -hmm. I love my child more than anything. And at this moment, I wish they would go the fuck away. <laughs> Do you know what I air mean? Air fern it up, baby. Just get in that corner. Air, air fern it up, right? Air fern. I'm going to have like, this will be my air fern. <laughs> <laughs> I love your interpretive air fern. <laughs> <laughs> I started out as a dancer. <laughs> <laughs> the one good thing I would say about this point in time of being a parent where we have one kid out of the house, one kid almost out of the house, oh. is I, about a year ago, started thinking, I need to shift my focus back to Bert. And I need, not that I'm caring for him or I'm neglecting my kids or anything like that. But the partnership. But the partnership needs to be reinvested in in a new way. We've always been a partner. We've never not been each other's partner. But something romantic happened in mm. my heart with Bert. And I think it's because I'm shifting into me and him again. Right? Oh, I love this. So when you're a pack of four, of course, I've always loved Bert and, and have been romantic with him, so to speak. But I feel more now like I did before we had kids. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I've been thinking a lot about this myself. So keep yeah. talking. So what's been really amazing is that just that moment in my brain where I went, I, you know, these kids aren't, I said this yesterday, they're not ours. They move through us, mm -hmm. right? Right. We are a vessel that takes them from one shore to the other. They get off the vessel and go on. Mm. That's what they're supposed to do. That's the point. But Bert and I agreed to be here forever. Forever. Mm. So once they get off, then what do our vessels do with ourselves? And it made me go, you know, I need to really um, find that deep gratitude I have for having this relationship with him from before kids and through kids to now reinvest like I did when we were dating. So when we were dating, my focus was um, how do we have fun to mm -hmm. just the two of us? How do I make him happy? Just the two of us. And uh, what do I want to talk about? Because, you know, when you have kids and you're in the thick of it, that's what you talk about. Yeah. And I think that's why marriages might fail. Maybe one contributing factor is that along the way, they stop talking to each other. You stop talking to each other. And then now kids are gone and you're like, uh, what do I talk to you about? It's absolutely. Absolutely. I actually, I just wrote something where I talk, where, where I said, it was a couple talking and, and she said, I felt turned on by talking with you, not just comparing calendars and who carried in more groceries. Absolutely. Right? Because it does, you. it becomes like, we're working together on a task, which is raising these humans, yeah. right? But the like the connection part. Mm -hmm. And and I've been thinking a lot about this too with mm -hmm. Josh and I. And I'm really fortunate to have a partner that I have such respect for and and such admiration for that I was thinking when when the time comes and these kids are off doing their own thing, do we need to like take up an activity together? Do we need to start our own little book club? Like, mm -hmm. but the truth is, is we still share a lot of ideas, but sometimes it's not till like 1130 PM when I'm about to fall asleep after we've talked about all of the mm -hmm. logistics, mm -hmm. you know? So it's really, I'm, I'm really looking to you as a sort of, oh. <laughs> I know I'm serious. Like, cause you're a few years, just a few, years, few years ahead of me yeah, that, that I ahead, can yeah. If you don't mind me, don't mind. You, uh, well, I'll tell no you. No pressure. Now that you say that, I think I've actually now that I'm putting the pieces together in front of you on this conversation. <laughs> uh, a friend of mine, Shiva, has been married to her husband. She's ahead of me. She has a daughter who's like a junior in college, and one that's about to go to college. And she and her husband date. They actively date each other. That's so cute. And I was. I think that I went. Oh, I think I'm going to start dating my husband again. Like. Living together and having sex are not the same right. as dating. You're right. As like 
last night where he goes, oh, Dwight, y'all comes in town. Let me get us tickets and let's go. And we're dating. You know what I mean? Tonight we're going to a prom fundraiser. That's a prom. And so we're dating. Are you dressing up? Oh, are we? Oh, I cannot wait. I'm wearing red sequin dress. I cannot wait. And he's wearing a red velvet tuxedo. You guys are the best. I'm so excited. (laughs) But I was like, maybe that's the subtle shift is to do what Shiva and Jeremy. They are so in love, those two people. It's the most adorable thing ever because they're kind of dating. And they've been together since they were in their 20s. That's it. That's Mm. the thing. I think that's the thing. I think you have to start dating each other again. You know, that. remember that excitement of I can't wait to go on a oh date? Oh, my God. Yeah. Getting ready for it. The anticipation of uh-huh. everything. Yeah. And really making the effort. Because when Bert and I go for a date, he's like, oh, you want to go get tacos? Yeah, let's go get tacos. And we're like schlubby and whatever. Right. And there's place for that, too. But to add that to the mix, to add that you actually have a legitimate date where you get dressed up for each other and you are romantic. And that's the point. And, you know, uh, I have to say. The events around Josh's job and my job allow for that every once in a while, mm-hmm. like organically. Yeah. So he's a props master on Broadway. So he's got new shows opening all the time. And we get dressed up and go to the opening night. of, And we always, it always feels like that. It always feels special. Like a date. But it's funny because I've never, it's never dawned on me like, you can self-generate those. Yeah, Like, right. I don't have to wait for his next Broadway show to open. Totally. For us to have a date. Like, I can, we can plan that. Yeah. I had that same realization last night. We're watching, we're at the Greek, watching the upcoming concerts. And I was like, we just need to buy tickets to a concert. I mean, that's, that's a date. It's easy. Isn't that so easy. dumb that you just get in this world of mom and dad uh-huh. and rote and who's making dinner and mm-hmm. it's just rote. It just becomes automatic. Mm-hmm. And to just take the moment to go, hmm, maybe we'll date again. I actually said this to Bert the other day. I was like, I find myself falling in love with you again. And he looked at me like, wait a minute, you were out of love with me? <laughs> I was like, that's not what I mean. I mean, it's more it's, nuanced than that, babe. Yeah, but yeah. That's right. It's just like, <laughs> like it was before we had kids. And that's very sweet and lovely. And I love that. And it's very fun. And how cool for the girls to see their parents like that. I think so. Although I think it grosses them out a little bit. Well, but it probably will for a while until they're a little older and then they're going to look back and be like, God, our parents were so in love. Aren't we lucky? Yeah, I, th- I think so. I think you're right. You know, yeah. I used to watch my grandma and grandpa. Yeah. You know, and just think they were the cutest little, little thing. You know what I yeah, mean? When they yeah. would like, he would, he would occasionally goose her on the ass. <laughs> Oh, that was my so grandparents cute. did not have that relationship. They were <laughs> well, lovely. We're Sicilian. There was a lot of butt grabbing uh, in general. They were lovely individuals. <laughs> but I'm not sure they liked each other a whole lot. But as individuals and how they loved everyone in our family, they were rock stars. I don't know how much they really they, liked each other. Oh, well. Yeah. you know, They picked at each other a lot. And I was like, mm. I don't want that. That's kind of gross. That's an, that's an easy dynamic to fall into. Isn't you have it? to be really, I find that I think that I, I have to be careful of that because the hypercritical voice that I think came from other generations uh-huh. through me is one that I actively have to. Do you hear that Bert's here? I do now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. From other generations, you have to actively like. Yeah, I have to qu- quiet, quiet her, you know. You have to, yeah. You know. Do you and hear this guy? They, I love it. He's so loud. That's just his natural volume setting, isn't it? <laughs> I know. You should live with it. Do you remember <laughs> that? Do you remember the uh, SNL skit of the guy who couldn't modulate his voice? No. Oh, my God. I think it was Phil Hartman. Oh. And he'd be like, I'm so sorry for your loss. Like at a funeral. <laughs> I think like I that. do now. Yes. I think I do now that you say it was Phil Sorry. Hartman. I just blew off your <laughs> sad, so, sorry so sound. <laughs> well, we should wrap up. Um how do we wrap this up, Stephanie? I could talk How to you all we, day. I know. I adore you. How uh, should we? Same. Let's um, let's both do our interpretive dance of an air fern. Of an air fern? Okay. And five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> <laughs> That's much more serious. Yours is, yours is me, Yeah, I, I feel like yours is, see, it's more spiritual than mine. <laughs> I'm it? an atheist. You mean conehead? <laughs> I'm Conehead from Bowfinger. <laughs> Bowfinger. Or is Mindhead. Sorry, Mindhead. Wait, is that one okay for the kids to watch? We should revisit. Bowfinger? Bowfinger. It's, it's got some dicey parts, but it's so good. So damn funny. There, I think there's a little bit of, isn't there a little bit of booby? 
See, I don't mind the, I don't, it depends on, it depends on how the woman, like if, I don't mind nudity. No, I think it's it was the context around yeah, it. Yeah, no, it was ridiculous. You know. I remember Heather Gray going, come back. <laughs> no, I'm running after you with my babies. And it's like that. Or it's just so ridiculous that's, that you're like, that's pretty I could ridiculous. actually laugh at that. That, that might actually be okay then. Such a funny movie. Because she was participating in the joke. She was. That's what made it okay. Yes, she was. But it, her character was being serious. Oh, right? she was. Yes. She was I don't know. I don't know where that was. She was a bimbo lies. a little bit. Oh man. So she was playing a bimbo, but like so over the top bimbo that it was ridiculous. So I don't know. Try 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 it out on the girls, see what they yeah, think. I'll They'll it. let I'll you know. Gen Z you. will let you know immediately. Yes, they will. If it is okay or if it is not okay. You are right about that. Amen. Um, I can't wait to celebrate with you on the red carpet. <laughs> Me too. And I can't wait to see you again. I don't know when, but I know I'll be going back to New York at some point. So next time I'm in New York. And if you I, ever come here. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I will. I love being in L.A. I love having friends. I love. And also, if you are in New York and you're always so busy, but I'd love to have you out to the house. Oh, we would love it. I'll cook you something to eat. Maybe oh. I'll make you chicken piccata. <laughs> <laughs> like the real deal? Like the real deal. Yes, yeah. I would love that. Well, it's been a gift to meet you, to know you, to share this experience with oh, you. I love you. It's Thank you. been Me too. amazing. And I chose right when I chose the cracker eating audition. Yay, the cracker lady. I you know. chose right. I chose right because of the friendship we created. Not just you and me, but you and Bert. Yeah. You know. Bert really adores you and thinks of you as a good friend. That so that makes that makes me feel so good because you know, especially in this like weird Hollywood world, it's deeply important to me to have actual connections with people because there's a little bit of this, a lot of that. You yeah. know what I mean? And and I um I can do that. Yeah, it's not my favorite thing to do. So when I actually connect with people, I'm yeah. like, uh, it's meaningful to me that you feel the same way. Same way, hundred percent. You're always welcome at my house, my table, Thanks. my couch. Your kids, your husband, everybody, please. Let's let's keep this going. Yes. Forever and ever and ever. And ever, amen. And ever and ever. Thank you so much for doing my podcast. <laughs> Thank you for having me. So glad to see you. I adore you. Well, same, same to Tell you. Tell all of your friends about Wife of the Party so that they can spread the word and this can become the most watched podcast. Watched, listened to. Either one. Both. Oh. Um. Uh, and what would you call this? A podcast that's about what? It's not. Is it not? It's not a comedy podcast necessarily. Mm. I think it's a podcast with good conversations. Com. Okay. So the number one, just good conversation podcast. Yeah, I have really good conversations with everybody who comes, and sometimes you we do. talk I about money. Comments. Sometimes we talk about grief. Sometimes we talk about. You talk about a lot of stuff. I talk about you? a lot of stuff. I, I like when you have the girls on. I do too. Everyone likes when I have the girls on. Um, sometimes I feel bad because I feel like the world thinks that I'm like exploiting them. But what my position on that is, I, they are so special. Uh, uh, all of our kids are so special. And this moment in time, I'll never have again. So if no one listens to any of their podcasts, I have them forever. It's your time capsule. It is. And I, I've told them, when I'm dead and gone, you have all these oh. podcasts. We can go back and listen to all our conversations, oh. and it'll be amazing. Oh, what a, oh, that's so cool. So for me, it's about that, and it's about um, just sharing these two people I'm so proud of. You know, yeah. I'm just so proud of them. And you should be. I am so proud of them. They're such great people. And um, they're going to go out into the world and espouse and share the things that they talk about here and learned here from you. And that, in turn, makes the world a better place, in my opinion. I hope so. I hope so. Because my whole my whole jam is about making the world a better place. Yeah. Being of service to the people that you love and strangers, all the same. That's what we should all be doing. If we all were Absolutely. of service, then we would all be happier. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It ain't brain surgery, baby. It ain't brain surgery. No. And. Air fern. <laughs> Thank you so much for you, Stephanie. <laughs> Thank you.